Good morning. And welcome on this beautiful Sunday morning. It's a very beautiful day. It's like finally getting those nice days. And I hope they stay a while because I'm not ready for the Julys and the hot. Um, if you could sign the attendance pads and pass them down, that would be great. If you draw a line between those that have already signed for the 9 and right 11 o'clock, it helps the person who inputs the, um, the, into the attendance into the computer to know which service you came to. Our prayer focus this week is for our scouts. Uh, this is Scout Sunday. Our Boy Scouts will be participating in the service and leading us in different things. Uh, but not only to pray for our Boy Scouts, but to pray for, we have a Girl Scout troop that meets here. We have Cub Scouts that meet here. So pray for all those scouts and the leaders in there. Um, also, our new Bible study, Life and Times of Paul, is to start this Tuesday, February 27th, at 5, 27th. February 27th at 5.30 in the COC. If you need a ride to it, there's a sign-up sheet on the back, but don't just sign up. Also get with Rick so you know when he's going to pick you up and he, that he knows where you live because if he doesn't know where you live, you will not get picked up. It's, it's one of those small details. <laughs> so, but we do make that available. and that's going to, If you haven't signed up to attend the Bible study, you are still welcome to come 5.30 at the, in the fellowship hall. We've got it set up already. This Wednesday, February 28th, after that, we'll be having a potluck for farewell dinner for the nomads. Um, they're, this is their last week here, and we're going to miss them, and then they're going to move on to different and more wonderful things So, as they continue to serve God in this wonderful ministry. But we want to well, say thank you to them in a potluck. We're going to, I believe, have chicken. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet back there to sign up so we know... Um, uh, what you're bringing and how many are coming so we know how much chicken, so please do that. And also this Friday, uh, we have a track meet at the school, and the track meet's going to start about 3.30, I think, but they start showing up about 2 o'clock, and our parking lot gets crazy. We need people here. And so we need people. Um, uh, Charles Huffman's looking for people who can help. If you can help them, to please call the office because we need help setting up and telling the people where to park, and we usually ask for a donation. And what we do with that donation money is we pour it right back into the school. We don't keep it. We take the money that they give us here, we pour it back into school in the form of a scholarship. And this year we'll be giving our fourth scholarship away to a satellite high school student. So, and we've been doing fairly well. We're looking at maybe we can start giving two-year scholarships, I don't know, instead of one year. So those are wonderful things that just comes from people coming to willing to help with the parking lot. So if you can do that, please let us know. And then this Saturday, uh, it's March 2nd at noon, we're going to celebrate Thelma Witzlev's life with a luncheon. We'll have a luncheon and then we'll celebrate her life in the COC. So if you want to come out and celebrate with Margaret and others, please come out and do that as we remember Thelma. And then our Easter egg hunt is going to be on Easter Sunday, which is March 31st, which is not all that long from now. Um, we are accepting candy donations now. So if you see them on special, would like to buy them, please bring them into the office and we will put them out there and have a wonderful time with the Easter egg hunt. And the other thing is on March 10th, that most evil and vile thing happens. The time changes. <laughs> Where we lose an hour of sleep and it's one of those things done by man to punish man. I don't mind the one where we spring forward, but I'd really hate the one where we, where we or the, I don't mind where we fall back, but that spring forward is just, I don't do well anymore losing an hour of sleep. But that's, you got one more Sunday, and then March 3rd, it's, you can sleep in the normal time, and then March 10th, if you don't change your clocks on March 10th, you'll come here and wonder why the service is ending. <laughs> well, with that, then let us prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
Amen. This time we invite our scouts to come forward for the opening ceremony. Good morning. So right now we're going to do a small flag ceremony. So audience, please rise and color guard attention. Color guard advance. Halt, color guard cross the colors. Post the colors. And now for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Color Guard Reform. Color Guard Dismissed. Audience may be seated. Well, keep standing. Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> for our call to worship. Let us give praise to the great uh, congregation in the great Let, Let all who fear the Lord give praise. The children of God stand in awe. Keep standing. <laughs> For our opening hymn, number 133, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. seated and we invite the scouts forward for a scout reading. Teach me, O Lord, the meaning of your laws, and I will obey them at all times. Explain your law to me. I will keep it with all my heart. Lead me in your commandments, because in them I find happiness. A scout is trustworthy. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. A scout is loyal. O oh Lord, God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, keep this desire in the hearts of your people forever and keep their hearts loyal to you. A scout is helpful. You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in one single commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. A scout is friendly. Some companions are good for only idle talk, but a friend may stick closer than a brother. A scout is courteous. Do not let any, let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful to build others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. A scout is kind. Make every effort to add your faith to goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. A scout is obedient. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient and to be ready to do whatever is good. A scout is cheerful. A 
A glad heart is good medicine. A scow is thrifty. Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy fellows. Learn from their ways and be wise. For though they have no king to make them work, yet they labor hard all summer, gathering food for the winter. A scout is brave. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For your Lord, your God, goes with you, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. A scout is clean. Who shall ascend the mountain of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? The person who has clean hands and a pure heart. A scout is reverent. It has been told to you what is good and what the Lord requires of you, only to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Thank you. Let's respond together with number 301. Jesus, keep me near the cross. out of the time where we lift up our prayer requests and our praises. And again, with any praises, other than it's good to see Laura back. She's back from her overseas deployment. And you're headed to Alabama sometime, right? We don't know when or just soon. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> And we'll keep praying for him. But... Yes, Ada. Yes, it's, they, the nomads did a great job, and it's a praise, and there are many praises for them. Yes. Yesterday you got new shoes, so that's a praise. Yes. Yes, uh, just a uh, request for prayer and a blessing on the class that we're going to start this Tuesday on the life and times of Paul. It's going to be an exciting journey, and I pray that the Lord will be there, the Spirit will be there, because 30 people will. So I just want to offer that up as prayer. Amen. Yes, Pat. So your son-in-law's brother? 
Yeah, I just make sure that, and he's doing great, and that's a praise. Yes. So Diane got her hip replaced, what, it was Tuesday, wasn't it? And she's doing good, and we praise God, and we'll continue for continued complete healing. Yes. Somewhere. She's hiding in the back. Is it your birthday? <laughs> Lil said that. Happy birthday. Yes. Okay. We'll pray for that, that that whole process of recovery is complete. Uh, yes. So prayer request for your grandmother just recently had a stroke. We'll keep her in our prayers. Thank you. Yes. We praise them, and we're glad that we can be a part of that. And also keep Willis McPhee. He's our worship leader of the first service. His mother passed away this last week. Um, they're looking to do the service this coming weekend, so um, keep that whole family in your prayers. Um, Willis is one of eight, he said, so there was eight of them. He said, my mom didn't work outside of the home. I said, if you raised eight kids, you worked. <laughs> I don't care inside, outside. You, you earned your keep. So uh, keep that whole family in your prayers uh, as they process and grieve and celebrate her life. Other prayer requests? Yes. So your best friend's grandson, they just found out he has leukemia and he's only two years old. And they're not sure what to do because it's so advanced. So we'll keep him in our prayers and that whole family. Thank you. Well, let us go to Lord in prayer. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we just come here this morning grateful for your love, grateful for your support, grateful for the hope, grateful for your mercy, grateful for healing, grateful that you never abandon us, and that you give us a promise of eternity. A place where all the things we have lifted up to you will no longer happen. There'll be no disease, no loss of limb, no loss of life, no weeping, just pure joy in your presence and gladness and song. And so, Lord, we thank you that you have a player prepared a place for each of us and that you've called us to go into this world, this hurting world, and to share this good news with those who are hurting. So Lord, fill us with your strength and your peace so that we can be your people, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ to all. That there is a hope when one is hurting. There is a hope when one needs restoration. There is a love when one feels unloved. There is a purpose when one feels there is no purpose. Help us to share all of that, Lord. So give us strength and power to be your witnesses. And Lord, as we gather here, we do lift up all of these requests to you. We lift them up to you, Lord, knowing that you are the one who can heal and restore, who comforts, who welcomes home. So be with each request that we have named before you, Lord. And we lift up not only these requests that we have named before you, we lift up all of those that are on our prayer list, Lord. Touch them as only you can. Restore them. Heal them. And we even now, Lord, lift up to you that one name, that one request that is silent in our hearts that we name before you now. And gracious Heavenly Father, we lift up our scouting programs here. And all the, those who are participating, all those who are helping, Lord, bless them all 
To the scouts, Lord, help them to grow, to discover the talents you have given them, the purpose you have given for their lives. As they go about doing many things, challenging themselves to reach beyond themselves to discover the power you have given them. Bless them, Lord. Not only our Boy Scouts, but our Girl Scouts and our Cub Scouts. And be with all the leaders, Lord, as they give it their time and their talents to help these young men and women to grow. And we thank you that we have the opportunity to intersect with them and to help them in all that we can do. And Lord, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ who makes everything we do possible, who gave us the example of love, of surrender, of peace, of joy, that all can be found as we love one another. We thank you for his life, his death, and his resurrection. And we now close the prayer in the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And at this time, we invite our children to head off to Children's Church. They'll go through the double doors over there, and they'll return at the end of the service. Thank you.
We now come to the time where we lift up our tithes and offerings. And one of the ways that our money goes back out is in their scouting programs. While we are opening up our facilities, they come and they use them. And of course, that costs money whenever they come because they turn on air conditioners. They don't sit there and sweat. <laughs> they do things and we make it available. We make our vans available. And that's part of how the money that y'all come in comes in and goes out to help people. And I thank you. And, and our scouting ministry is one of our oldest ministry. It's the church will be 60 years old this year. We've been in this, working with the scouts for 60 years now. They started working with scouts as soon as the church started with this troop. And so we've been going with them for 60 years now, and that's been a blessing. So this time, I invite our scouts to come forward who are being, acting as our, usher, our ushers. Well, come on up here first. And then we'll spread out after we pray. Let us pray. Grace Heavenly Father, we thank you for so many blessings. We thank you for your love, your grace, and your peace. And Lord, now as we present these, our tithes and offerings, multiply them for your kingdom and guide us in their use. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
you may be seated.
want to thank our scouts again for coming and helping us lead us in worship. They did a good, they've done a good job, haven't they? We're not always as forthcoming with instructions, requiring them to think on their feet sometimes. Okay, where do I stand? Where do I go? What do I do? And they do great. So thank you so much. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, the eighth chapter, beginning of the 31st verse. Hear now these words. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days, rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, as we continue through Lent, <clears throat> this being the second Sunday in Lent, we look at one of the more difficult statements Jesus ever made. And it goes against everything that seems natural. And when you look at where our country and the world seems to be heading, it goes against where the world is pushing, where our country is pushing. See, we're becoming very selfish people. We don't like to give up our time and our talent anymore. We always want what's mine. And, I, and that is what we get when one no longer believes in God. I've always said, if you want an example, is there a God, it's look at life without a God. And life without a God becomes very selfish and painful and hurtful. Someone forwarded me this some time ago on Facebook. It's, you know, they send those little pictures with words on them. And I don't remember the image, but this is what it said. It said, if I like it, it's mine. If I can take it away from you, it's mine. If I had it a while ago, it's mine. If I say it's mine, it's mine. If it looks like it's mine, it's mine. If I saw it first, it's mine. If you're having fun with it, it's definitely mine. And if you lay it down, it's mine. If it's broken, it's yours. <laughs> What's interesting with these pictures with the words on them, what they call them are memes. And the term was first introduced by British evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins. He's a very vocal atheist in his book, in his 1976 book, The Selfish Gene. And his original concept of a mean was analogous to a phenom, the smallest unit of a sounder in speech, or a morphine, which is the smallest meaningful subunit of the word. But Richard Dawkins chose to spell his word meme, M-E-M-E. -E. And whenever I see that word meme, all I can think of is me, me. It's all about me. I'm, I'm throwing this out so you can see all about me. And he's not the only one who got into that. It's all about me. Apple is huge in the all about me. Everything they make is labeled what? iPhone, iMac, iPad, i, i, i. It's all about me. And if you remember those game consoles, some of you may not, but some of you kids might be too young. The Wii. We had to go and spell a we with two I's. Instead of W-E, it's W-I-I. -I. We are so focused on me, I. And the thing that comes out of that kind of thinking is it's destructive. Because things don't happen because we need one another. As I think about the scouts, I can only imagine what would happen is one day all the leaders decided to go, you know, I've been doing this for years and I ain't got a thing out of it. When is it gonna be my turn? I wanna go do something now. The heck with the kids. The scouts would suffer. But instead, they thrive because they have leaders who said, 
I know I could do something this time, but I'm going to spend it with these because it's valuable and it brings life. And see, when we look at this concept of giving of ourselves, of dying to self, it takes time. It's not something we can do right away. It's something we have to learn to do. It's something we have to grow into. And I've always likened our, our faith is like a journey. From the moment we say yes to Christ, we are on a wonderful journey with Christ to perfection. We don't get to perfection right away. We journey to it. And that journey, along that journey, there's going to be many times there's off-ramps. We want to go off those off-ramps because it's looking good over there. It's looking good over there. And, and maybe we're thinking that the road Christ is leading on us is kind of hard. And so we wander or we get off on the wrong road. I remember when I was a kid, my dad was in the army, and so we moved a lot. And there was one move where we were moving, and this, we didn't have GPSs back then. You had the map. You had to look at the map and figure out what roads to get. And sometimes my dad thought he was on the right road. And you would go about two hours before you realized you were on the wrong road. And now you don't know where you are because you've been two hours down this road and you're trying to figure out from when the next cross section where you are. And that's how we get sometimes in our faith journey. We think we are on the right road, but we've convinced ourselves that the wrong road is the right road because it looked right but it wasn't. It wasn't the one we were supposed to be on. And that's how our spiritual journey is. We can convince ourselves that we are on the right road when we're not. And I think one of the main reasons that Jesus came when he did was that I think God said, I know I'm going to send my son because they're going to so mess it up that they need to be shown where they're off track. And this is what the Jews eventually did. They had turned everything that God had given them. They forgot that they were supposed to be a priesthood of all nations. They were supposed to be a light into the world. They turned it all into a set of rules. To be in a religion and not a relationship. To be in something that had nothing to do with love. And Jesus came to help us get back on that right track. And that track involves us doing things that we initially don't like. Dying to self taking up our cross. We look at that and I go, that that doesn't seem right. That seems kind of harsh. You know, I don't want to do that. See, that's a problem that Peter was having in our scripture this morning. Jesus is teaching about salvation. He's teaching about that he is going to be rejected and that he's going to be killed. And Peter goes, that's not a road I want to be on. You're talking crazy, Jesus. And Jesus rebukes him and says, you're thinking too much like the world. And not enough like the Christ, by he- not enough like heavenly things. See, Jesus calls us to be a disciple. And one of the things I find is only disciples can walk on this road for a long time. Spectators have trouble staying on this road. Those who are just partially interested have trouble. See, a disciple is the one who walks on it because if you're not a disciple, you will grow to hate this journey. Because a disciple will give to God freely, whereas a spectator will think about, well, all this money and resource and time I have, I could be doing it somewhere else. A disciple is eager to come to church on Sunday and to sing with the saints and to hear a word from God. A spectator begins to think of other things they're missing out on Sunday morning, even if it's just sleeping in late. A disciple prays easily to God on a continuous basis where a spectator begins to say, man, I'm just talking to myself about things I wish were different. There's a difference between a disciple and a spectator on the journey of life. And that's what's hard about being a disciple, the willingness to die to self, to live for others, to live for Christ. And this is the example Christ gave over and over and over again until he gave that ultimate example of allowing himself to be crucified, allowing himself to die for our sins. That's the example of the love he gave us of the power he's given us. See, at the cross, we see this sacrifice of God, this love of God, this example of God. And this is the example Christ gave over and over again. And then, Pastor again, we hear that one of these most troubling calls, Christ calls his disciples together and says, if anyone want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And some have said this is one of the most twisted concepts in the Bible. The people have taken that phrase 
take up their cross and they've, they've misapplied it. I've heard people say, well, I've got asthma. That's my, my cross I've got to bear. I've got a lazy husband. That's my cross to bear. I've had this happen to me. I've got this cross to bear. And that's not what Jesus is talking about. There are things that are going to happen to us in life because this is a fallen world, but those are not crosses we bear. Christ tells us how to endure the storms of life. But the cross is something we choose to pick up. It is not something that happens to us. We choose it. We choose to say yes to denying ourselves. And this is hard. Dying to self, dying to our own desires, making our wants come in line with God's wants is hard. And it takes a lifetime. John Wesley wrote this prayer. It's usually given on New Year's Eve. That's back when we could get people to come to church on New Year's Eve. Those days are going. But part of the New Year's Eve, you would look forward to a new year. And this is a prayer that many churches and would say that Wesley wrote. And the prayers, it's kind of like the Beatitudes. They're very poetic, but when you dig down into it, it's, it's hard. And the prayer goes like this. Wesley prayed, I am no longer my own but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for thee or laid aside for thee, exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. It's a prayer that cannot be said just once. It's one that we must remind ourselves over and over that we're surrendering to God's will. I love that Paul would talked about it one time. He says, I die every day. He's reminding the people that I have to remind myself that I don't belong to me anymore. I belong to Christ. And I must surrender my will until my will becomes God's will. And then he can use me as he sees fit. And see, it also reminds us that we are free to surrender our will to God to submit ourselves to the authority of Jesus Christ. We have that power. And when we do, I think we find a wonderful power. See, until you actually do, until you actually serve, you don't see the blessings that come in it. And what I've learned over the years, the more I go and give of my time, the more God blesses me with other things. The more I give of my resources, the more God blesses me to make the resources I have be a blessing to me, no matter how little they are. See, God transforms us when we die to self. It's like this story about two young brothers who were caught stealing sheep years and years ago. This is a time when punishments could be cruel and lasting. The punishment for this community that if you were caught as a thief, they would brand you on the forehead. And since they stole sheep, they branded them with the letters ST on their forehead for sheep thief. Well, this resulted, one of the brothers just kind of left. He couldn't bear to walk around town with this thing branded on his forehead. And he just wandered aimlessly around. But the other brother decided to stay in town. And he was remorseful. He, he made restitution to the people he stole the sheep from. And he began to be a help to everybody he could. And he lived this way and lived this way. And eventually he became simply an old man in the community loved by all. And one day a stranger came to town and inquired, what does this ST in his forehead mean? And the person goes, you know, I don't really know. It happened a long, long time ago. And I don't know what it is, but I think the letters mean saint. And see, when we take up our cross, God takes the ugliness, the wrong in us, and transforms it into something new and beautiful and wonderful. A transformation happens in us when we take up our cross. We become a new creation, a new person. When we die to self and live for Christ, we find the power of service. We find that we can enjoy life because the worry about ourselves is gone. I mean, so often most of our worries is about ourselves. What's going to happen to me? What am I going to do? Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? 
when you finally devote yourself to others, you just stop worrying about yourself because you find that God will take care of you. There's this wonderful story in Guideposts a while back. There's a man named Arthur Gordon. He had visited kindergarten class to view the teacher who was there. Before I went into the ministry, I, for many years in a row, I was on a committee that would get to go into the schools and watch teachers. We'd rank, rank them in for an award to see who would be the best teacher of the year in different classes. And I think that's what he was doing there. And while he was visiting, watching the teacher, there was a little kindergartner misbehaving. And the teacher said, stop being a wham. And immediately the kid stopped misbehaving and straightened up. And Gordon kind of is thinking about, what the heck is a wham? And he asked the teacher, what is a wham? And the teacher told him that she was trying to teach the kids to be less self-centered. So she wanted to th them to think about others' need, not just their own. So she taught them that no one liked a wham. And a wham stood for a self-centered person who asked, only asked, what about me? Have you ever asked yourself that question? I'm sure you have. Have you ever thought it? Somewhere in life's journey when things weren't fair, you had to think, because I know I've thought it many times, well, what about me? When's my time? What's... We, that's a natural thing. She said, on, she said, what I'm trying to teach the children is to be a way. And a way stands, what about you? And have you ever asked that question to a neighbor, to a friend? What about you? What's going on in your life? What do you need? Where can I help you? And as I thought about that, the early Christians were known as the way. It was a way of living. It was a way to eternal life. It was, it was a way to God's heart. Living for others was simply a way God called us to live. And the idea of bearing one's cross was to offer up our brokenness to God. See, the Romans, they didn't create the cross. They just modified it from the Greeks. The Greeks invented the cross and the Romans perfected it. It was meant to break people and to break people who were thinking they might do what those broken people on the cross were doing. But what God does when we take up our cross and we willingly break ourselves from our own selfish nature, God takes our brokenness and he takes the brokenness of Christ and the two come together and something new and powerful is created. Something new and wonderful is created. It's our offering our brokenness to God and he makes something new and wonderful in it. And one of the hardest concepts the early disciples faced and we face today is the very cost of dying to self and living for God. This is an act of taking up one's cross. And to take up one cross, must one must put down their will, their life, their dreams. But when we take up the cross and we put down our dreams, we don't just take up the cross, we take up new dreams. We take up God's dreams for our lives, God's hope for us, God's power for us. So we're really not giving something. We're exchanging our selfish nature for God's love of people. We get a partner who will then take us deeper into ourselves than we could ever imagine where we would find a peace that no one can take from us. I love what someone wrote. He said, to bear the cross proves to be the only way of triumphing over suffering. This is true for all who follow Christ because it was true for him. I can stand here today. I tell you, I'm not there yet. I still have my selfish days. Not as many as I did when I was in my 20s, especially not as many as I was in my teenage years. But I'm still on that journey. I'm still learning and dying a little more each day. See, because that's because taking up a cross is a daily habit in our faith. I hope you're learning the power and joy that comes from doing something so radical as dying to self and living for others. Because whenever people do this, the world takes notice. And they always ask, why? Why did something do something so powerful? But that's what we're called to do, to share the power of Christ in these unselfish acts. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for all you give us, all you love us, the example you gave us and how you sacrificed your son for us. 
So Jesus, help us every day to take up that cross. It's hard. It is so hard because we want things in this life. We're bombarded with desires for things in our own hearts. But Lord, show us that when we surrender to you, you don't abandon us. You don't leave us destitute. But you complete us. You restore us and create in us something new. And you give us new dreams and new hope more powerful than the ones we could ever imagine. So fill us with those new dreams, your will, your way. We pray this in your son's most precious holy name. Amen. Please stand together for our closing hymn, number 474, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. This time we invite the scouts to come forward for the closing ceremony. Color guard attention. Color guard attention. Color guard advance. Halt. Color guard retrieve the colors. Color guard dismissed. Thank you. See the benediction. Let us reach up and grab God's hand, knowing that He will never let you go. That as you learn to love as He loved, He will be there to encourage you, to strengthen you to bless you. So go in that power and love the world as he loved. Amen.